I'll now request uh, Prof uh, Dr. Abit Sen uh, to please uh, make his presentation. A uh, very brief introduction of uh, a person who's actually uh, deserves a much longer and fuller introduction. Uh, Dr. Sen is among our premier uh, psychiatrists practicing uh, in Delhi. He's the founder of the Children First Mental Health uh, Institute, and he's uh, practiced uh, child psychiatry for uh, almost two decades here in India. And <clears throat> he uh, studied at the AFMC Pune, then went on to do his MD in psychiatry at Nimhans, and then was in the UK for many years, and then came back to India. And uh, it was, in fact, this institution is one of the first that has actually focused uh, on mental health issues relating to children. Uh, Dr. Sen. Thank you, Shabnam, for inviting me. And, uh, and I'm uh, uh, no doubt very pleased to be a part of this forum, but also uh, um, in, in many minds as to what to bring to the fore. I think what you brought, uh, brought to the forum about looking at the perpetrator in different shades and not just in black and white is very pertinent because I think if we have to understand hate, the experience of hate, the feeling of it, the thought processes that go into it, um, I, I think this forum is, we've come together here because we see uh, it uh, ramp rampantly being played out in the community. And it threatens to completely uh, split people, societies, even families, in ways that sometimes at least appear to be irreparable. And, uh, and to be able to understand this phenomena, which is uh, fairly large and complex, I think we also need to probably understand how is hate experienced at a personal level and what it does to you. And, and uh, from a psychiatrist's point of view, uh, I'd like to reflect a bit on that. So hate is actually a feeling or a position that all of us have probably taken from time to time. I mean, you know, you, have, you hear teenagers shouting out to their parents these days, I hate you. Or you know, when you have a breakup in a relationship, you experience hate. So when, um, and, and, and that is something that is played out over and over again, uh, you know, in real life, in literature, in movies. Um, and I, I think the crux of that kind of hatred is to do with uh, a sense of betrayal, a sense of deep hurt that uh, comes out of uh, human experiences. And, and indeed, um, uh, that kind of hatred or that kind of anger that is associated with it comes and hopefully often goes away. And we all have experienced it, right? The problem is when it begins to stay and fester. And it begins to stay and fester because sometimes these experiences of hurt, betrayal, perhaps fear, um, which then begins to lead to paranoia and a sense of threat from people and the environment, it begins to crystallize in your head and mind as attitude and prejudices, right? And it's that then that it begins to affect relationships, behaviors, your own health, both physical and mental, and so on. And indeed, that is the kind of hatred which begins to affect pretty much uh, not just the person, but the, the whole world around them. So um, the one thing, as you know, was said right at the outset here was that most of the time when we talk about hate speeches, hate crimes, and this dynamic, we're talking about the victim and we hardly uh, talk about the perpetrator. It is, I think, important to understand that to become um, a perpetrator of hate, there needs to have been some damage at an emotional and psychological level deep down. And it is only from there that attitudes, prejudices, thoughts, and eventually intense emotions, which then translate into behaviors, they emerge. So it's, uh, of course, I, I could take you through perhaps some of the um, changes that happen even in the brain when such intense emotions or experiences are are encountered. So uh, we now know that uh, you know, mm, 
both the victims and the perpetrators of hate and, and trauma and violence, they go through a lot of changes in the brain, in the endocrine system, for instance. Uh, just as an example, there is something called the uh, HP axis, which uh, translates to hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, which is to do with the endocrine system. And when we go through such experiences, there is a huge surge of certain kinds of hormones in, or uh, um, neurotransmitters in our brains and bodies. And the two predominant ones are cortisol and adrenaline. And I'm sure that some of you are familiar with some of these names. So, uh, and, and if there is persistent presence or persistent heightening of some of these, um, uh, the, these uh, endocrine um, chemicals, then it begins to bring about changes. It brings about changes in your blood pressure, your heart rate, uh, then it uh, begins to actually affect your digestive system, then it can actually eventually give rise to peptic ulcers, heart disease, and now we know even bring down your immune system, it can give rise to cancer. So a lot of these things begin to happen even in your physical body, right? So um, yeah, starting from thyroid dysfunction to indigestion, ulcers, headaches, migraines, all of that can happen when there's an upsurge of this. And when you are living in a position of hatred and your predominant interaction with the world comes from that position, it is um, by default that these, uh, you know, these, these, uh, um, chemicals are, are on the rise in, in your system. And, and again, uh, there are many other uh, things that are consequences that happen when you carry this hate, and some of that has actually got encapsulated in studies. Now, as we have said, that the studies are mostly about the victims, but some studies about the perpetrators say that there is an increase in eating disorders, car accidents, coronary heart, rate, uh, uh, heart disease, addictive behaviors, even diabetes, um, uh, and, and, and what have you. So there is a, a personal price to pay, and it's important to understand that when you take the position of hatred, in the beginning, you come from a position of vulnerability. So only when you actually feel threatened, you feel fear, you feel a huge heartbreak or repeated hurt or exploitation perhaps. You know, for instance, uh, we know for a fact that children or adolescents or young people who get abused or exploited often end up becoming abusers. So they become perpetrators eventually, isn't it? And there's a, there's a transformation, there's a flip that happens. So if you're not able to process the intense feelings that you feel when you have such extreme experiences, they begin to become a part of who you are as a person. So you internalize it, and either you become depressed or you develop eating disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder, or you make it a part of an angry person who is um, hateful towards people and the world around them. So it's a, it's a shift from a position of vulnerability to a position of seeming power and seeming invincibility. So a, a hate monger or a person who takes that position often believes that they're in a position of power and, 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 and they can gather people like him or her and, and make a community which is then into othering, pushing many other marginalized Dip people who seem different to them, and they see them as threats. And, and the, uh, although the conscious experience is one of power, the deeper uh, substrate is one of, one of hurt, vulnerability, and damage. And that is the thing to understand. And, and that is the thing that we probably at some level need to, need to address. So at some level, um, you know, the personal experience of hate begins to um, connect with other people's lived experience of similar experience of, of violence and exploitation. And then they begin to uh, form collectives of hatred and, and communities of hatred. And that is probably what we are most concerned about today, isn't it, right? And um, as I said, that it has a, uh, definitely a positive fallout for people who perhaps have not been able to address their deeper wounds and in many ways because of partition and many other things that have happened in our recent history, um, I often think that ours is a wounded generation and that we carry these wounds deep down and it plays up every now and then whenever there's a trigger. So uh, just as you said right at the outset, um, Amritullah Ji, that uh, a lot of the times the perpetrators and the victims are actually from uh, the margin, you know, um, lower socioeconomic strata with less education, and God knows what kind of wounds they've been carrying for generations. Right. And, and sometimes these wounds are passed from one generation to the yeah. other. They're transgenerational. And they carry it 
you know, just as, uh, you know, uh, you, and you carry attitudes and, and prejudices, you know, I mean, you might have noticed that in many of our households, you know, uh, even when little children are growing up, the way they talk to, let's say, the domestic help, right? Mm. And you suddenly wonder, where is that tone coming from? And the tone is actually coming from the child's observation of what the adults are doing, isn't it? They're imbibing the atmosphere of class and caste, perhaps, right, within the household, right? They don't have to be told about it. And in similar ways, when there is a household which has gone through, you know, the pain and the trauma of, let's say, partition or any such experience, life experience, they carry within them the wounds and the hatred. And even if they don't talk about it actively, the children growing up in those households will also carry those prejudices in similar manners. And that's what they will take to the streets, to the relationship, to schools and colleges. And, and, and therefore, this, this, uh, this turmoil within, you know, this, this inner sense of uh, the world is doing me wrong, that people are out to get me, that I have to come together to protect myself and, and hate others to be able to survive, never leaves you. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of is taken into the community and, and lived repeatedly over and over again. So there is transgenerational trauma and there is tra transgenerational hatred that gets transmitted from one generation to the other. And till the time we are able to break that cycle, till we are able to address it in a different way, as some of the countries, like you named Rwanda, and last year, in fact, uh, uh, we had the experience of going to Rwanda and mm -hmm. we, uh, and, and over there they've kept it alive, you know. I mean, although the genocide happened in the early 90s and uh, just to give you a perspective, in a country of seven million, one million mm -hmm. was completely wiped out, massacred within a month. And, and, and that, it came to that position because over the two, three decades before that, there was hate mongering at a large scale. Yeah. So there was pro propaganda, there was, you know, speeches on the radio, there were pamphlets, there were posters, there were new newspaper articles othering one community, right? And categorically and consistently told that if you do not, you know, take care of this, if you do not annihilate this, this population, you will not survive, you know? And, and that kind of a, a feeling of threat, yeah, would then, you can imagine the kind of, um, the, uh, the, the perception of, of, of deprivation, of injustice that grew amongst the perpetrators who then unleashed this violence, right, and, and kill, as I said, uh, you know, one million people. But the way they went about uh, restoring their country is what I, is quite remarkable because they didn't put, push it under the carpet. They didn't get on with life just like nothing had happened, you know. They actually addressed it, they built museums, they had churches with clothed, bloodied clothes of the massacres, which are still there. If you go to those churches, mm -hmm. those bloodied clothes are still lying, you know, uh, on a row of benches on the side. They have a vivid graphic depiction of, pi through pictures, through narratives about how this whole thing happened. And everybody, including adolescent children, visit these places mm -hmm. to remember what had happened to them, to understand the, the dynamic, uh, to break it down in a way where uh, they understand it deeply enough for it never to happen again. And, and there were also, uh, you know, like, um, and, and I'm sure that we'll at some stage or the, or, the, or the other talk about restorative justice, that they built kind of um, courts in rural areas and small towns which were like restorative justice where the perpetrators could come and own up to what they had done. And they were not punished for it. They were not put into jail or hanged for it. But they were, you know, allowed to heal. They were integrated into societies. Of course, there were consequences of it. They had to perhaps, you know, do some community work. They had to actually do some reparative work in the community. But the whole approach was to see the perpetrators not just, as you said, completely black, but as people who were influenced by what was going on over decades um, in that country. And f for us, in our country, I think we also have to be cognizant of what has been happening, perhaps even much before uh, uh, partition and, and what we've been through during that time, and what we've been through repeatedly in the form of riots and polarizations and our caste and class systems and, uh, you know, how we've dealt with our, uh, the minority and marginalized po uh, populations, whether for religion, for disability, for, for race, all of those things. It's a spectrum of things that we have actually not been able to address, and we have perpetuated these cycles of violence. So uh, it is indeed, um, um, you know, from a, a very personal, psychological, emotional experience, it, it can't help but become a social issue because you are, after all, 
relating to other people, you are taking people along, you're influencing each other. And till the time we are able to see that in the social context, in the larger social context, which is why, what you've been doing as historians, as um, uh, you know, as professors and researchers, uh, researchers of sociology and, and literature, but till the time we are able to see it in, you know, as a continuum of what happens within the individual and what they go through as perpetrators and how then it begins to impact the different systems around them, I think we'll be, you know, probably working in silos. And it's a, it's a wonderful effort, therefore, I think, Chavnam, um, on your part to be able to bring us together so that we can see the different um, aspects of it from different. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sen. That was, I'm sure, uh, all of us here in this room uh, will appreciate uh, the, uh, com again, I would say the complex and uh, deep perspective that you brought uh, to us on this issue, linking the personal with uh, the social and the community aspects of it. Also, uh, emphasizing that the perpetrator uh, is essentially somebody who has a vulnerability at some level. And that's the basic weakness which then gets, it makes him open to him or her, or open to the uh, ideologies or motions of hate, you know, and that we need to look at that as well if we are going to be able to address uh, this issue. 